good to be in the house of the Lord. Say this with me. Say, Lord, I give you place. The only place that matters. So I rebuke every power and principality, every spirit of condemnation and guilt, and I cage up every bird that will try to steal the seed of the kingdom of God. And I speak to my vineyards, grow, 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 be fruitful. I want a harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, just started this series last week. <laughs> we just started this series last week, and it's called Little Fox. How many people understand these little foxes that want to try to steal stuff in your life? Get right there to the point where you're ready to start to see something big, and it's just like it's gone. What happened to it? You saw it, but now it's gone. It's no good. Well, that's a big part of what happens in our lives. And we have to understand that there's vineyards, and we're, we are absolutely held accountable to these vineyards. We saw last week in the midst of that that there's more, but I've we just come up with five. The first one is our soul. The second one is family. The third one is the church. The fourth is the ministry, which is yours. And what's that fifth one? Workplace. Who said that? Somebody did that right on the button, praise the Lord. So we have to work this. And yes, I know you're thinking, the pastor, you don't know my vineyard. You don't know my workplace. It's full of a bunch of hellions. That's exactly why you're there. You're there put in that hard spot right where you're at to start to work that ground, to cultivate a seed of the kingdom of God that will absolutely produce the heavenly harvest for him. That's what it's supposed to be about. The enemy is going to try to come in to still kill and destroy, but God has given you power above anything else to be able to destroy the works of the devil. Why? Because that was what his plan was when he came and he lives in you, and that's your plan right now. Sometimes we just got to, you know, gird up our loins, suck it up, and just start the battle. Sometimes we have to work on the ground, but I, and I understand that that's not really something that's popular, especially in our culture today, work. It's not an evil word. <laughs> it's not. It's actually pretty good, especially in Christianity. We've taken it to the point where we don't want this. You know, we should never. God has given you the ability to work. This is why we have grace in our life. This is why we have the Spirit in our life, so that we could do something. And if we're not tending to something, especially the activities of the Lord, we're tending to the activities of the devil. Because the devil eats the flesh. We go back to the very beginning of Genesis, we find out exactly what the Lord says when he was cursing that enemy. Remember that? He says, on your belly you shall be walking the rest of your life, and you shall eat dust. Eat that dust. Eat that dirt turned around and said to man, he said, because of that curse, you're going to go back to it. Dust you was, dust you'll begin, you'll go back to the dirt, flesh. But every time we step in the flesh, it's just like a big banquet feast for the enemy. This is why we must walk in the spirit and not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That is a word. That is there. I want you to go with me, if you will, to the Song of Solomon. I'm going to try to be very careful on your time. I don't want to take too much of your, your time today. Some of you are probably thinking, well, where is Psalm of Solomon? Go to Ecclesiastes. We'll finish up right there a little bit of the mystery of the Bible. We're going to go all the way to the spiritual end of it. Ecclesiastes is right after Psalm of Solomon. We'll get there. Psalm of Solomon. And there again, as I said last time, guys, I'm not going to speak about this part where everybody loves to preach on the Psalm of Solomon about, you know, love and sex and all that other stuff. But we're not going to touch that today. We're going to touch really what this is about with the Shulamite and the Shulamite. It relates to us. We're going to start chapter 1, verse 6. I'm going to lay down a, a, a ground of us to be able to see that we have to work these vineyards. Verse 6 says, Do not stare at me because I am swathed. This is black. For the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me caretaker of the vineyards. But I have not taken care of my own vineyard. Now let's go on over to chapter 2. We're going to hit verse 15. There, say amen. The 
this should be a good prayer for us too. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while our vineyards are in blossom. Man, we've got to get this. This, to me, is something that destroys us. But, but we always heard that it's up to us to catch those foxes. Well, if we take this in the spiritual sense that relates to us, the Shulamite is speaking to her king, which is the, to her husband, and, and this would be us, if we were the Shulamite. We are the bride. And we're speaking to our Savior, we're speaking to our, our bridegroom to catch the foxes for us. He knows where the foxes are, he knows where they're coming in, and he need, is the one that needs to catch those, so that you don't fall to that same junk all over again. Isn't it time that you start to really reap what you've been sowing? Isn't it time for you to start to reap some of the harvest that God's worked for you, that you've worked so hard in prayer? How many of us seems like we pray, but it's just our prayers aren't answered? It seems like we're trying so hard, but the more that we try, the more that we sort of fail or fall, but yet we turn around and we see those who don't even care about the Lord or even walk it seem like they're prospering in every direction. Doesn't that seem like that? Well, I think it's if we would come back instead of us trying to catch the foxes, we ask the Lord, Lord, catch these foxes in our life. Because they're trying to pull up my vineyard. They're trying to take away every bit of fruit that I have. But then God turns around and gives us seed, which is the word of God. And he says for us to work this seed, to plant it, to cultivate it. To we have to do what scripture actually shows us in common to every man is to weed, water, and then wait. Some of us seem like we've been in a waiting process for a while. But some of us haven't even started to weed some of our grounds yet. We're still allowing all those, those sins that should have been taken care of long before. The gossip, the lying, the cussing, the drunkards. All, all those things should have already been taken captive and already been covered under the blood and die, die, while we're allowing God's fruit to rise. Then we need to water this and to water it good through prayer, through the cultivation, through scripture even more to where we're making that ground good, get rid of some of the rocks. And today I want to touch just a little bit of this to, to get us on this mindset. So here's the first part I want us to really understand. That if we're tending to the vineyard of our soul, then the vineyard of our families, our churches, our ministries, and the workplaces will organically take care of themselves. They will absolutely grow, but you have to take care of your vineyard. How many of us are doing that? As soon as we start to hear this little thing about, about complaining and gossiping, because I'm just throwing some out here. So I'm not picking at you, so I better look like this so you don't think I'm talking about it. So, no, as soon as we start to do this, we need to take that captive. I'm not going to fall to that. I'm better than that because he lives in me. I don't have to fall to what this flesh thinks I'm supposed to have. How many of us are emotional seekers? Some of us are emotional buyers. We buy something, it's like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have bought it. Anybody ever been there? Don't raise your hand. I know none of you are like that, but it does. We get to the point where, where even in, in, in our relationships, we become emotional. Did you see the way that, she, that he looked at me or the way that she said good morning? Hmm, just see how that is. That brother can go over there. That, you know, I don't like that church because they don't look at I don't like that person because they don't dress right. I don't like that person because he's loud. I don't like that person because he's just who he is. Man, we have to take all those captive and to plant the seed and to cultivate our heart for love. For love is the ultimate of all things. Now, love's not an acceptable part where we hear this really way out there love that says no matter what sin you're living in, it's okay. God accepts you and he stamps that sin is acceptable. That's not how that love is. The love of God grows so much that it takes over and we weed that and it shows us the difference between a wheat and a tear which by the way you won't know until they're at harvest when they're at harvest then you can recognize the two this is why the lord said this in matthew chapter 13 don't go about and tear up those tares yet until they grow together and then at harvest i will send my angels that will reap up those tares along with the wheat at least you tear up the wheat as well so sometimes we have to let those things grow so we can see even more. But the vineyard, the, this keeper of this vineyard, always knows the condition of the soil, knows what it's working with. They send out inspectors to check this. They check the quality of the soil to see if there are weeds or insects, diseases, whether there's erosions, rocks, whatever it might be. And I have a good friend of mine that this is what he does for a living too now, is he goes and these people, these farmers will hire him to go out to check the soil 
to see the moisture content, to see if there's acid in it, to see if there's, there's, there's maybe you know, weeds that need to be taken up or rocks or whatever it might be. He can tell them what they need to do to plant so that they can take care of their vineyard, take care of their harvest. <laughs> Once the quality is known of this soil, whether it's rocky or stony or moisture content, acidic, the richness, the insects, the weeds, whatever it might be, then all of this could be known and the proper remedies, the proper actions could be taken to remedy this part so that we could see all of those things gone. And the ground soil, see that soil fertile, to see to be able to do something. Soil fertility refers to the ability to soil, for the soil to sustain agricultural plant growth. It's something that we need to provide plant habitat and the result to sustain the consistent yields of high quality, a fertile soil always has these properties within it. It has great things. The ability to supply essential plant nutrients and to water accurate amounts and the proportions of the plant growth and the reproduction. We have to do this with the word. What do you do when you come in for a word? When you come into church, everybody's looking for a word. And I'm, I'm one of these guys. I love to prophesy, but I'm going to tell you where, where I really love is I love to prophesy where the mass gets it. I'm better at that. I like that better. Because personal prophecy, as I was sitting talking with a man yesterday that was telling me about this guy prophesied, then this woman prophesied, and this guy, and, and it was just sort of there. But it, it, it messes with us because what ends up happening is we will listen to a man's word instead of God's word. So for me, I don't find, and I don't want to be careful because I don't want, to, I don't want anybody to think that I'm against personal prophecy. I'm not. But personal prophecy, if it's not hindered underneath the guidelines of love, Scripture, and the Spirit of the Lord, will lead man astray in a minute because it will puff man up and never build up God. So therefore, the gifts of the Spirit and all that are really torn down, taken to a side, and we become flaky, more flakier than a box of cornflakes. There's nothing to sustain. We build our house, we build our stuff off of sand instead of solid rock. So with that, for me, I like to, to, to throw out a, a, like this, a, a sermons that make you think, but yet sermons that will quicken your spirit. Sermons that will make you go, wait, but this is the Lord speaking to me because I, this is what was going. That's where I start to work the harvest. And you guys are that ground to see these things happen. So this is part of watering the word that's here. When you come in for that word, you've got to tend that ground. Those prophecies that are given to you, or those prophecies just in this, in Scripture, the promises, they're all given to you so that you can tend it. You can cultivate that so that it produces the harvest. You just can't pick. This is why I'm not a blab it, grab it kind of guy. You can't just pick a Scripture out there and say this fits you and throw it up and think that you're going to get a million dollars. How many of us have tried that? Does it work? I've heard this before, you know. Man, you're going to get what you believe. You believe for a million. I've been believing for a million dollars since I could remember. I've been believing for a bigger church for us so that nobody's got to wait for the bathroom. Oh, I got to go, got to go, got to go. I think you smell much if you're trying a new dance until I really know I got to go. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those to where, man, it's got to be God's will lined up to the prophetically through here. So as I cultivate that, I could put it underneath the filter of truth and love and what his word truthfully says. And now here's what happens. I get lined up with what Jesus is praying for us up there. And now I could bring heaven down to earth. Are you with me? I can now plant the seeds of what Jesus has for me, not the seeds of what my flesh has for me or what somebody else says they've got for me. Because how many of us understand that the only one that we're supposed to be held accountable to really in this sense is Jesus? Who's going to produce the harvest in you, man or Jesus? That's what we got to look for. So usually when our flesh says, yes, 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 it's really not God, God, God. You didn't want to hear that, did you? I could tell because you're like, oh, honey, there goes my new truck. <laughs> Sorry. I'd like to have one, too, but it just ain't happening. Something we got to bring in. Well, also with the, sir, with the fertile soil, we also find the absence of toxic substances which inhabit the plant growth. The fertilization of the soil that may require rocks to be dug out, irrigation and drainage ditches to put in there, fertilizer mixed in, trees, shrubs, and sod that can be planted to stop some of the erosion. And if the soil is not deep enough, we got to dig deeper. So in other words, if you're still there, you're not seeing some fruit, it's not because that that that... that seed isn't there and it's not because you're not watering it maybe it's you got to dig deeper back in the day when we would go into the old testament time where they were planting seed 
they don't do it the way that we did. Yeah, there's, their rows were never straight. They were just sporadic. This was part of what Jesus says in this one, one parable we'll get to. But what they would do is they would cast the seed, and then those with the plow would come back through and break up the ground to mix it together. Sometimes it's got to go deeper than what you think. Sometimes you've got to keep it maybe a little bit. Listen, God, I really want you. And here's what I'm going to throw this out. So I'm not going to don't have nobody in mind. Do you hear me? Tell me I hear you, Pastor. Because I don't want somebody to get, oh, he talked about me. I ain't talking about none of you. If the shoe fits, get you to the altar and change shoes. <laughs> it's a simple. Put it to you that way. Some of us are coming and they're saying, God, bless my relationship, but you're living in sin. How could God bless a relationship when you're having sex outside of marriage? How can God produce for you a good home when you're living in a home full of hell? I'm throwing it out there. I'm telling you the truth. And don't look at me and think, well, he's just saying that because he's not. I've been there. Me and that woman lived together, and she was pregnant before we got married. That's where Michael came from. Yeah, that's why he's the way he is. Yeah. But we went through delivered, so if anybody wants to say that, I did. Praise the Lord. Anyway, so in the midst of this, here's where I want to go. God can take this ground, and the only reason, the only reason, and I'm absolutely a thousand percent sure on this, the only reason that God has blessed this vineyard is because we gave him that vineyard. Understand, his son bought it. His son bought you and everybody else, but until we give him the rights to the vineyard, he can't come in. So when we gave him the rights to the vineyard, which means we're now living for you, that stops. And some of you that we've taken through and some of you we will take through, some of the, 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 the premarital counseling, you hear us right off the bat. you got to stop. Sex stops. If you're living together, you need to get apart now. That's the way it's got to work. Oh, you're too old-fashioned. You call me old-fashioned you want to. I don't care. You could call me religious or fanatic or whatever. I don't care. This says you can't do that. Why would you want and think and expect a blessing from the blesser when all you're doing is cursing the ground in which he's supposed to have? Oh, man, it's, I hope you get it without getting mad at me. But if you get mad at me, then you do part of it well when we start to understand to dig deeper then god can add stuff to us we find rocks we never saw before but then we could take if we go deeper yet we'll find rich good ground that starts to mix with that other ground on top and then before you know it you got like a miracle grow harvest Ping! and it's like yo this is good i know some of you are still looking at me i can feel it you're back on that little part about you're wanting god to bless your relationship because you're living in sin let me tell you this. Hello, Lord, what I got? I'm doing it anyway. When me and Kim, when we got together, we had a great relationship right off the bat. I knew the Holy Spirit told me she was my wife. We had it great. But the moment that I gave our life, our relationship unto the Lord and married, did exactly what we're supposed to do, is the moment that I watched that marriage just boom. I watched that relationship just boom. I watched Holy God just come in and do something amazing in it. And now we're tighter than ever. It's been, man, you talk about shakabuma booma. Yeah, let me tell you. Yeah, when you, when you got your, 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 your marriage house under the Lord, hmm, that bedroom's hot. Mm -hmm. The couch is hot. Don't look at me that way. I'm being honest with you. Everything you need is hot because God's the owner of your house. He's not trying to keep sex from you. He's trying to keep it for you. He's not trying to keep the rom romance to be able to keep it with you and your, your wife away or you and your spouse away, you and your, 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 your girlfriend, boyfriend, whichever one you're with, away. He's trying to keep it for you. That way, when you come together, then you're held together as something that's good. And when the fire of the Holy Ghost comes in a relationship, it is absolutely welded shut. And this is why I've got to tell you, if you're in a marriage, man, I don't know why I'm speaking this, but if you're in a marriage and your vineyard's on your family, and you thinking about going to somebody else's vineyard, you better jack yourself up and get to the altar, honey, because God wants to do something in it. And if you're in a relationship that God's not the owner, you better stop, get to the altar, give him the ownership so he can plant the seeds that needs to be there. 
because nothing can separate it. Nothing. Nothing. Well, you're just speaking. I'm telling you the truth. And he needs that. Your ground needs to be absolutely fertile. Absolutely fertile. And it only happens through what Jesus did. I really want you to get this today. Even you young'uns that ain't even thinking about marriage yet. You start thinking about that. You give God your ownership of your house right now. You start praying for the spouse that God's got for you right now. And you watch what he produces in him. And then at that right time, you won't have to, to pull your clothes off to make somebody accept you. Because your heart's accepted by him. And then when that one comes together, that won't be there. You'll be already had it weeded. You got it watered. And you've waited. And now it's time to produce the harvest. Imagine that. Well, that ain't popular today, is it? That ain't even in my notes. So I don't know what's going to go with that. That's their fault. They prayed over me before I got up here. So the other part that we have to do or we see with the, the soil that is fertile is it's weed control and it eradicates all diseases, all diseases, everything. You can't go into a relationship. You can't go, why am I in a relationship? You can't go into relationships and think that you could look at somebody else or start to think about somebody else. Do you understand that? This is the same way it goes with Christ. Some of us failed this part. We want to come and say that we're a part of Christ and, you know, he's everything to us and we're marrying him because that's what it is. It's not taught the covenant in which you enter into when you become born again. It, what's taught is you just say, Jesus, you're saved from hell fire. I got news for you. You're not saved from hell fire. You're not. Not until you get married to him. That's it. And getting married to him says no to everything else everything else and it is good because when you give him your whole life your whole life he will give you a blessing like you have never seen he'll give you peace like you've never had a love and a joy that surpasses anything you could think of because i could tell you one thing right now when i'm not around my bride my heart goes uh, 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 it skips but you get me around my bride and it's like yeah, I feel good. We, so we were apart last week for a while. And I want to tell you, I felt it. I was talking. We were FaceTiming. Yeah, FaceTiming. We were doing all that, you know. But there's only so much you could do on FaceTime. You know? And I'm not talking about your, that other. I'm talking about really being able to reach out and touch. Because for me, I'm a touchy-feely kind of guy. Some of you know that's why you run from me. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> But for me, to be able to walk through, come here, to be able to walk through, and guess what? Yep, I know. Come on. To be able to walk through life, I need this worker in my vineyard. I need this. Anybody ever see those, those pivot sprinklers or this pivot irrigation system? Just let me see what you're like. Whoa, laugh. I'm down at the south. Y'all supposed to be farmers and in hill, well, I can't say hill jacks. They're from West Virginia. But anyway, so you ever see those big water sprinklers like on wheels in a big field? That just, that's, that, that's what I'm talking about, right? Well, she's like that for me. So God plants something, and she waters that for me. But God plants something in her, and I water it for her. Are you getting that? So guess what? Today's her birthday. I didn't plan this. I can't tell you how old she is because she'll probably really get mad at me, right? Right? And some of you are probably going to say, well, you didn't sing me happy birthday, Pastor. Well, that's okay. Just take this one with it. I'm going to sing happy birthday to her. So if you want to join me, you can. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kimberly. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> I didn't plan that, even though some of you are thinking, man, pastor is slick. You think that's slick. You ought to see some other stuff I do. Some of you know, because we counsel with you, and you're like, dude, where'd you come up with that at? It's like, it's not me, but it's the love of God, right? 
So how many of you, I need to go, I don't know why I got to do this. But I'm gonna, how many of you guys are, would, would really forget like the Valentine's Day cards and anniversary cards? Anybody? Really, every one of you, except for my boys, every one of you remember those? You lying to hell? Yeah, that's right. Keep that hand up. See, I got another. I got another one. I got some guys who are trying to be honest. Yeah. Well, well, I'm going to tell you how to fix this. Honestly, this is a really good way. Go, hey, 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 that's enough. Go to Walmart. Walmart's got cards. Go inside those cards and take a picture of that card. Then text it to them. Not only do you save money, <laughs> but it's one that you can't throw away. <laughs> Is that not good? See, now you're, you guys are going, man, I wish I'd have thought of that. Yeah, especially you guys that are money misers. I'm really seeing it. Tim Hall's going, man, I could have saved this and that and this and this and this. And this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. My, my, my father-in-law used to go and buy all these cards and keep them and all the time, and he would just send them all out. And I'm thinking, man... I was sitting in the store, and I'm thinking, i got to get Tim a card. And, and I was going through this, and it was like that day. And I said, man, I ain't there. So I took a picture, and I sent it to her while she was in the store with me. Because how was I going to get the card out? <laughs> so she sent back. She said, that is so sweet. I'm like, cha-ching. <laughs> yeah. Somebody said, that's how you work that vineyard? <laughs> See? See, you guys are getting all kind of great pointers today, right? Right? And none of this is in my notes. <laughs> yeah, 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 praise God. Okay, let's keep going. Jesus speaks the importance of the soil of our heart. He really does. And it's really cool. And we find this in Mark chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 3. So go there with me, if you will. We're going to talk about four soils, and I'm going to do as much as I can today. Because I've got 10 pages I need to get through. I know, I try my best though. All right, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow, and as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the roadside, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up. And because there was no depth of soil, it had no root, it withered away. Wow, wait a minute. That happens to us all the time, doesn't it? Especially when there's no depth. The sun comes up, and what happens to it? It's gone. How many of us have been there? We've planted and we planted. We think that we're in good ground, but it just seems like you can't even remember what you really have planted. This is part of where he's going with this for us, to understand how it's there. Let's keep going here. Other seed fell among the thorns. Yeah, here it is. And the thorns came up and choked it out, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell on good soil. And as they grew up, it increased, and they yielded a crop and produced their 60, so, well, from 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. And as he was saying, as he who has ears, let him hear. And he's not talking about ears of corn. He's talking about spiritual ears. We find four soils here. One of the soils right off the bat is a hard heart. This is the one that's open for satanic influence because it's influenced by the devil and sin like crazy. The second one is a hollow heart, one that just doesn't feel anything. There's no more conviction of sin anymore. You're just sort of happy with where you're at, but yet you, you sort of receive the word a little bit. The next one is a half heart. You're half in, but I'm not all the way there. I love you, Lord, but I don't love you enough to get rid of this. As I talked about that relationship that you might have right now that might not be absolutely lined up to Scripture and you're living in some sin, you don't love a Lord, the Lord enough to get rid of that relationship or at least make it holy for him to do something with, giving it to him. And that last one is the whole heart. That's the one that's sold out for Jesus. Well, in this, that roadside that we find out, which is that, that hard heart where Satan comes in, this represents the beaten path. That beaten path of a hard heart that won't accept the seed, the words of the kingdom. And it did not need to see grace. It says no need for that or no need for salvation, which allows the enemy in. And there's a lot of people like that. It's sad to say there's more people with a heart like that in this world and here in this nation than there is anywhere. There's more even in the church than we could realize right now. It just makes me sad. It also shows us, remember as we talked in Proverbs chapter 24, that foolish sluggard, how he was with his own vineyard? 
It also shows us this, where the walls were tore down or beaten down, and he didn't bother tending this because he didn't see no need for it anymore. It's part of that. It opens up the doors for all kind of trespassers. That, that beaten path, that hard ground, is one where there's no more knowing where God is or where he isn't, where the line is, and where people keep traveling, bond through over and over, that makes that ground so hard that we allow the enemy in. So now we follow just whatever's good in our own eyes. And I find in Scripture that every time we do, we fall away from the Lord. Every time we do. It also goes with this. This allows the devil and his agents access to steal, to kill, and yes, to destroy. I was, as I was going through this, I had a picture in my mind of a scarecrow. Anybody ever see those scarecrows out there? And when that scarecrow is to make sure all the birds and the animals flee. It makes them scared, right? Can I say something to you? If you will allow the enemy to see you like a scarecrow in the midst of that ground, but only you crucified with Christ, it'll scare him off too. He won't even think about, and those foxes won't even think about coming into your vineyard because he who is inside of you is greater than he that's outside of you. And you could do all things through Christ, the resurrected Christ who's within you. So it's not always a demonic issue. Well, the majority of times, and you need to understand this, the majority of times there's a crucifying of the flesh issue that opens the door for the enemy to come in or to allow God to come in. Because where you say you crucify yourself and where you do, God is allowed in to reap the harvest that he needs to reap inside your life. So then the second one is where we find the soul, the flesh. This is the hollow heart. This is the rocky ground. This represents those who hear the word and gladly receives it, but has no depth of consecration within them, none whatsoever. There's no root of endurance, no stability to stand. When the heat of the persecution of the trials and tribulations start to come, there's no power for them to be separated from them outside because here's what's happening. I got to love them where they're at, so I accept them in the midst of accepting them. I don't want to turn away from my drugs. I don't want to turn away from my sexual immorality. I don't want to turn away from gossip. If you ever suffer with gossip, if you ever started to gossip, you'll know that it usually happens when you're around people who like to talk a lot, those who like to gossip. You have a way to cut that out, and that's to get away from them. Stand up and be separated from them. That's what Scripture says. But we don't do that, right? It's the same kind of thing here. There's no root in somebody to say, wait a minute, I'm not doing that. I had to do that with some of my family. I did. To step away from, not just because they were gossipers, because it, there was a lot of things that were, were, were really absolutely just immoral. And if I wouldn't, I would fall to that. I would fall to the drugs, or I'd fall to the drinking, or I'd fall to the sexual immorality, and I know better than that. So I'm not going to give the devil an opportunity. I'm going to make sure that my border, my fences, my walls, my barriers are up. And not allow those foxes to come in. Do you ever notice a fox, though? They're never loud, are they? They're not big. They don't boast about their strength like lions and tigers and bears, oh my. But we always know them by their tails. They're real sly, real sneaky, in and gone before you know it, right? It's the same way we could tell a fox in our life, by the tail, the only different tail, not a T-A-I-L, but a T-A-L-E in our life. As soon as we hear a tale that's contradicting the word of God, you could do this, you could do that, you need to get, get rid of that fox. Something we need to think about, I think, a little bit more than what we do. It also goes on a little bit more. They understand the word and they have some affection for God's word, yet their hearts are not truly broken by the word. So as it's said that that seed of God's word is standing on their heart where there's nothing to be able to sink into to produce fruit. This is also where we find out that the soil that's there, as he goes with this, isn't soil that's stony, but it comes with what's known as a rock table. So what it's said to believe by some, that there's a rock, a big slab of rock, and there's anywhere from two to three inches of dirt on top of it. Anybody ever try to dig, and as you're digging or put a, a, a steel pin into the ground, and all you're doing is hitting a rock no matter where you move? That's because you're on a rock table. I know we used to try to build houses, or we used to build houses, and you used to have to try to break through those. So it would take some, sometimes having to, to use some dynamite, some jackhammering, some drilling, all kind of things. And, and up north, as Bill and them will tell you, up north, it's, it's as stony as you could get. That's why New York is called the rock. New York is a rock itself. 
You ever, you ever see those movies where they're at New York and you hear this bing, bing in a, in a construction car? You know what they're doing? They're driving these big beams down into the ground through the rock because it's all rock. This is part of what he's talking about in this scripture, that it becomes that rock. But this is also where we find in here that that soil might be good for flowers, but it's not good for food. Think about that for a moment. Is your soil good for food or just good for flowers? Is the relationship you're in, is it good for food or is it just good for flowers? Something that looks good, smells good, but has no substance to you, has no nutrients to your spirit. Not all relationships are good for food. Boy, is that hard, huh? Yeah, that's good, though. I like it. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, that's good. But it also goes about where we find that they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. It goes where Jesus said, I'm on your lips, but I'm far from your heart. See how that works? But then we go on to that third part of that soil, and this is where we find that it's actually those among thorns. This is the worldly or half-hearted. Somebody say half-hearted. This is scary because the half-hearted Christian in the half-hearted soil is the one that Jesus talked about in Revelation when he says that you are not cold nor hot. You are lukewarm. So if I got a guy, anybody in here named Luke, I'm not talking about you unless your heart is hard or half. We want to get that soft and pliable, right? Let me say yes. Okay. This represents those who hear and, and but yet fail to produce the food because of three different things. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. First John tells us all about this in chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. And it says that we fall to those things. We do. Our flesh starts to rise up. Gimme, gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy. I'm changing my name to God, Anita, and I got it. And next thing you know, God's out of that. The, per, the, the pursuit of that money, the pursuit of the worldly achievements sometimes can really take away from the virtues we need to be walking as a Christian because we're pursuing those so much. We do everything we do, and I know from my own experience that's where I was. Everything I wanted had to be where, where I was at the top of the ladder in construction or I was at the top of the ladder in somebody's life or, or a fighting drink, whatever it might have been. Oh, I could drink more than you. Anybody ever do that? hope not. But as you sit there, you know, before you know it, you're drunk and you're on the floor. And you have no idea who won because it didn't matter. Nobody did. Yeah, it's part of that. We're always trying to achieve something. And I want to say this, and I want to be careful. So please, please understand, I have nobody in mind. Say that. Pastor has nobody in mind. Okay. Some of us will pursue, some of us will pursue these things in, in worldly achievements, whether it be in a big bank account or the biggest one that I see a fad that's happened, and I'm not against people that work out. A, a fad that's been happening a few years is the exercise. I've watched countless Christians fall away because of the exercise that they're doing now, trying to get their physical bodies in shape, but they forget about their spirit bodies at the same time. So now what ends up happening, and I know plenty of them that are, I mean, these people are great. We've had a family that's close to our heart, really, really close, that years ago got into, she started training people. She was doing so much of this, her and her husband, and they would go and do all these other things. And, and man, I, I just had this, this word that the Lord had told me that was going to happen, and they didn't listen. They didn't see it would be them, and they have fallen away. They have fallen away. Because of the pursuit of what something looked like. And you know what makes it? When you start to do something and you feel good because you're able to accomplish, you're, you're losing some weight, you're getting yourself built up. What happens? You feel good, right? You feel good about yourself. Say yes, Pastor. Yep. So next thing you know, somebody comes to you and says, you know, you're so good at this, you ought to start training. And next thing you know, you start training somebody, and now you're pursuing that rather than pursuing the things of the Lord. And now God's voice and his word are deafened to you because of the pursuit of something that's not your vineyard. Just threw that out there, whether you wanted to know it or not. This is the last one. This is the other part of the good soul. This is the good soul. This is the one that gives their heart to the Lord. This is the person who carefully tends their vineyard, who takes the word of God, who takes and makes sure that their, their gardens are good. They're planting it. They're plowing it. They're watering it. They're doing everything they can. They pick up the cross. They're following Jesus until they become the finished work of Christ. That's who we're supposed to be, church. 
we're supposed to be these ones that can do this. When the word is what changes us. Here's the thing. How many of us say, well, I don't think they need to do this. I don't understand why this church does that. I hear it all the time. I don't understand why this, the music's so loud. I don't understand why they go a little bit long. I don't understand whether, I don't understand whether, it's because God hasn't planted you here. You're trying to tend somebody else's vineyard. Shut up and take care of your own. Because I'm sure if we looked at yours, your walls would be tore down. And there'd be foxes tearing that path up like crazy. So in other words, get to your own work. It's up to you. I can't tend your vineyard. I can't. The person sitting beside you and who you're complaining to, they can't tend your vineyard. You got to do it yourself. This is a bad word, though, today, isn't it? Because the word of today is, I'm free. I am free. Oh, I am free. Ain't got no religion binding me. I hate religion. Man, that scares me. Because we allow the enemy to come in to say that religion's a bad thing when religion is the working of your faith. It's you practicing what you believe. I don't know about you, but I believe in God Almighty. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe it's a song that we sing. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the three in one. I believe he's God and Father that wants to be us. He wants to, to be a family, he wants us to be his children. I believe he wants good things for me. But I believe that he wants to work it in me. And I got to say no to a kingdom so that I could be a part of another kingdom. And I got news for you. It'll happen if you do. If you say no to this kingdom called the world, called this age, you could say yes to a kingdom that will endure forever. Because if you say yes to this kingdom on this earth, this culture today, hell still has power in your life. The grave still has power in a sting. But when you go to the other vineyard and you give it to the Lord in that kingdom, it is powerful. It's joyful. It's good. Because I could tell you, one person that will beat you in every, every kind of exercise, wrestling match, football game, baseball game, whatever you're trying to do, whatever, raising money or whatever it is, one person will beat you all the time because he already beat the world. His name's Jesus. And it's all about that. Hebrews chapter, chapter 4, verse 12, starts to tell us a little bit about a dividing of these two people that believe and the hearing of this, because the hearer has great impact on what's going to be harvested in our ground. And as he, he turns around to show us how that separates us, it's pretty decent. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. And it's, I love this. Being able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the So here's what he says. The word of God will cut you like a knife. It'll separate what kingdom you're in. It'll separate who's, who's really the husbandman of your vineyard. You, the devil, or God in you. That's simple. That's simple. Because just as a farmer has to be in co-laborship with the Lord to produce, so, does, do, so do we have to be in co-laborship with the Lord to produce in our walk. Has to be. And when we submit to him, he produces a harvest. Now, I understand this thing. That is, it was, yeah, joyful, jumped up, and hee hee, oh, happy day kind of things. But this is needed. I'm tired of watching people go from church to church and service to service, prayer meeting to prayer meeting. I'm tired of blood bought and Holy Ghost-filled saints. They're telling me they're tongue-talking and doing all these and prophesying, and they're still living a life of hell. I'm tired of watching people come up and say, God, you've got all that I am, and yet they're walking out, and the devil's the great I am. I'm tired of seeing them, their faces on Facebook and every problem that they've got and every great thing they do plastered on Facebook when their heart and their, their face and their mind is not in the great book. I'm tired of seeing people while following Instagram and post, posting all this stuff when they're not even understanding the great I am. This is what this is about. This is what this church is founded on. This church has been founded on Jesus Christ. It's been founded on family and through him. It's been founded on prayer. And I'm not changing it. This is a family. And this is a vineyard in which I'm a really, 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 really hard worker on. I want to tell you what we need to do. And guys, when hell really starts to rise up, what are you going to do? 
when pressures start to come against you and you've got to stand in front of the Lord, what are you going to say to him? What, 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 what profits are you going to have to give to him? When the world starts to really put pressure on us and they're starting to, how are you going to stand? Are you going to stand and say, well, I loved? The Lord said, but you didn't love me. Get away from me. I never knew you. Manipulation, intimidation, it's not God. Sacrificing. Given everything. Consecration. That's God. Now, I know this is I'm far from my notes, but I'm, I'm going to stop with this because we're over. But I, I really feel this today. I want to ask you, right where you're at, what part of your life really needs to go today? Man, I so wanted to get into these vineyards. I so wanted to get into some of the cultivating parts of this. But I've got a really, I've got a real ache right here in my spirit. That ache in my spirit's telling me that somebody sitting in here, whether it's mass of you or just a few of you, some of you sitting in here right now are deceived by the deceiver himself. The enemy's coming in and he's wreaking, just wreaking havoc in your vineyard. He threw tares where your wheat needs to be. And God's calling you before it's too late. You don't want to hear that voice, though, it's too late. We don't hear that by the big popular guys on TV or on YouTube and all these other churches. But that doesn't matter. I need to get you to understand this today. Right now is too late for you. Right at this moment. You're not promised for that breath to come out of you. You're not promised you're going to make it out of these doors. Right? And I'm not trying to guilt you into anything because I don't believe in that. What I do believe in, God's wrenching your heart because I can feel it. Don't you look over this. Don't you pass it as just something that's there that'll go away. You who think yourself safety, do you who think yourself safe and great and secure, you best get yourself off that high horse. You best get yourself on your knees. You can look at your shoes all you want. It's the same ones you wore when you came in. I'm telling you right now, there's a spirit of the Lord that's prompting your heart. And I need to speak this to you. I don't like to give hard messages. That's one thing I'm not really, really proud of doing. But when it comes to knowing the voice of the Lord, and it comes, and I could call you out right now because he's showing me people. He's showing me. Like he's showing me the sins that you're living in right now. You need to get those things cleaned right now. I think before we can go even on any further to address any foxes, you need to start weeding and tearing up and getting rid of those rocks in your vineyard. There's a call to repentance right now, and you better heed that call. You've got to get it. You have to heed the call. There's a pursuit for your own achievements. There's a pursuit for finances. There's a pursuit for all kind of things that essentially make you feel good that's going to lead you straight to the gate of hell. You better listen to this right now. I don't care if there's an addiction eating you up. I don't care whether it's just a sin because you're looking at somebody else. I don't care what it is. You best be getting your heart right now. You better be getting to the altar because I'm telling you, just as Jesus said, there's a day when darkness is coming and it's going to be too late. That day could be right now for you. Right now. You don't have time to play. Most of us play all the time and we think we're good because we were brought up in church. We were baptized as a kid. We were taught this is good. I need you to understand something. You're not good until he says you're good. You're not. And just because you were water baptized or just because you think you're praying in tongues doesn't mean that you're secure either. It doesn't. I know plenty of people that have been water baptized who supposedly prayed in tongues and led thousands astray and killed millions. You can't take the blood of Jesus and throw it to the ground. You can't take his body and trample it underfoot. We can't. This is a time where you need to get it right. And I know that probably after this, most of you won't come back. And I'll be honest with you, I'm okay with that. Because I have got to speak something into you that you can't stand in front of him and say, nobody told me if I had just one more time to repent. That man sitting over there by that big blonde over there, he had an accident one time on his bike, twice on his bike. He was sitting and he couldn't, but wasn't able to repent because of where he was. 
you're not promised that same accident to be able to live. Do you understand that? Do you really understand that? No, I know some of you are probably going to blast me on Facebook. I can't wait to hear it. That's okay. Right now is that day. Right now is that call. I'm not trying to be hard. I am being so truthful right now. It's not about joy, joy, lolly, lolly, gaggy, gaggy, have fun. It's about surrendering your life to the Holy One. It's about marrying in Him, walking that way, and never letting go. Right now, producing fruits of your repentance. John the Baptist spoke that. He screamed that. And I got news for you that days of what we hear, the message of prosperity, that's alive from hell. That the message that's trumping that is the mind of John the Baptist. Make a straight path for the Lord to travel because he is coming back in a hurry. Yes. Amen. That's where it's at. Man, I still want to do this. So here's what I'm going to do. Guys, come on up. Bring this communion over, would you? Scripture talks about communion. It said that a person that eats and drinks this without proper discernment, eats and drinks themselves to damnation. I sat with a, a young man not long ago, and we were talking about this. And you hear me say this all the time. This meal that heals, this, this body that saves, this one that brings us together, this is love. This is the cup of love. But this is the body of sorrows. This is a body of affliction. This is a body of hurts and rejections. But that was made solid for us. Here's how I want to do this altar call today. I want it right where you're at. As these guys get to start to play. Are you kidding me? Are you absolutely kidding me? Are you done yet? Bring it up here. Everybody give Brian a hand. Hang on. Some people think they understand prophetic painting. Let me say something. They really don't. Did you know what I was saying today? I didn't know what he was painting at all. Hold it up. I want you, I want people to see. And I want, if you, yeah, yeah, if you got a phone, take a picture with him with this. I want you to put it on Facebook. I want you to put an Instagram. You got to hold it up. Stand up here, buddy. Ooh. Time to not pass her out. Yeah, stand up there so they can get, get a better picture. I know, I'm, I'm really pushing you to it. That's good, isn't it? Isn't it? Now let me speak this. I had no idea. Listen to me, those of you that don't believe that God works this way. I had no idea that he was doing anything like this. Nothing. I really, and if you look at my notes, and, and some of you got it because you pray over it, this has nothing to do with my notes. But this is the word of the Lord. And yes, the enemy was here, but he went out of here with his tail on fire. He did. Because he's trying to tell you that you're good. He's trying to tell you it's okay. You've got tomorrow. Time is now. And that's the heart. That's what I'm hearing in my spirit. Time is now. Quit playing. Get rid of the gray area and get your life right, right now. Right at this very second. Right at this second. So before I go, what do what made you do that? The time. Did you feel it pressing on you? <laughs> It'd be so cool. It'd be... Now, look at it. Stop for a second. This is a miracle of the Lord. Like this, this. The God could use such a spirit 
to tie you in a wave together, that he produces something together to make you become one, to produce the fruit of what his voice says. You want to know what a prophetic word is? It's not thus this is going to happen, that's going to happen. You're going to speak in front of multitudes. You're going to see, you're going to go send to the nations. This is a word from the Lord. This is prophetic to the body. That's what he's talking about. setting in a place. And some of y'all understand our visitors, I get that. But well, you got to understand the richness of this place you're in. This house is not anointed. This house is anointed. Do you get it? God doesn't stir up and anoint homes or articles, physical articles. He doesn't. He doesn't anoint this. He doesn't anoint this. He doesn't anoint this. He anoints this. He stirs up this. And when he does that's the harvest in which you've got to see. That's the sign and wonder that you've got to hear. But you better heed to these words today. You better heed them deep within your spirit. And you better stand and repent today to get in that right place and say, Here it is, God. Here's my vineyard. You work it. Because I need a harvest from you. I need the harvest from you. You have to. You're in a church, you're in a family that God has anointed so many great people. And Brian's just one. They're all over. The one sitting beside you. Yeah, maybe you too, I think. But the one sitting, they're anointed by God. We have this church. Is so this ministry is so absolutely blows my mind with the speakers, with the intercessors, with the anoint. Look at this. The, the, I'm at a loss for words. Riches, I'll make you wealthy. I'll show you a sign and a wonder. It's really cool because what I find in Isaiah, the Lord goes back and he, he starts to talk about how he, he, he speaks of how he's separated the seas and all that, right? Right? But in the next chapter over, you know what he says? Behold, I do a new thing. That's the new thing. <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. You just thought you, you, you ain't getting this from my heart, right? It's okay. Brian, thank you. God, I want to thank you oh, for blessing us today. Blessing us with your presence. Blessing us with your anointing. Blessing us with your voice. So God, I ask that you release those fiery arrows into deep into the heart of each and every one of us. God, consume us in every area and help us, Lord. Help us because, Lord, we are weak. We're living in a world, a culture that does everything it can to steer us aside by the cost of what you said is love. They pervert this love to make it just no power, no effect to it. They pervert the message of the gospel of grace to where there's no power to it. But God, we stand on that message. We stand on it today. And we say that our lives will be transformed today. Lord, so do a mighty work in us. And Lord, as we get ready to, to just play a song of worship, before we get into communion, Lord, I ask that you will now start to really work on our hearts. For those, Lord, that don't know you, Lord, I ask that they open up their heart. Make them willing, God, to want to know you. For now is that time. God, I don't want one to perish, not one, not one. But Lord, it's ringing so hard in me right now. Lord, you know I don't like doing fire, hell, fire, and brimstone. But God, I can feel the, I can feel hell just getting cranked up. I can feel that brimstone being collected. But God, please, please show us mercy and grace. May we stand in what you've given us. For I love you with all things. I praise you, Jesus. I want you to stand right where you're at. And you guys, just, just do something. Just play something. I don't care what it is. Just right where you're at, I want you to stand. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask the Lord. I want you to ask Him what a part of your life needs to be given to Him. How do you make it right, right here, and never go back? And let Him take care of that for you. Ask him to take those boxes right now. Ask him to forgive you of all that's there and to show you what true repentance is right now. Make it right. And if you need somebody to pray with you, 
grab a hand, that person beside you. And if you don't have somebody there, come and grab somebody else because we've got plenty here waiting to pray with you. I don't want you to leave here and for just not get this. Just let it pass by you. Please don't struggle with nothing anymore. You can come to him and those wheat will absolutely be ripped up and you'll produce wheat. Will you do this today? As they play, pray.